Hey everyone, my name is Joe Lergio. I'm the general manager of the Caverns in Pelham, Tennessee, which is just south of Manchester, just north of Chattanooga, about an hour and 15 minutes south of the great city of Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for joining me on this presentation called What's the Price for in Real Life? Uh, you know, I struggled with what that topic was, but I think what it boils down to is, is what have we done as a music venue to survive and get by over the last year, which has been a year and a half at this point, a struggle for, for everyone involved. But we are struggling to survive. The Caverns is a underground music venue. So if you've never heard of it before, um, Literally, we're inside of a cave in Tennessee. Tennessee is one of the most caviest places in the entire world, not just the country, but uh, we have over 10,000 caves just in Tennessee, and they are a beautiful uh, natural resource that Tennessee has, and uh, we like to think that we highlight the natural resource and the natural beauty that we have um, right here, literally underneath our feet. Um, it's one of the most unique venues and, um, you know, artists and fans combine together to have incredible, unique experiences um, inside the caverns. You may have heard of the venue. We also tape a television program there called Bluegrass Underground. We tape that for PBS. Uh, it's an Emmy Award winning television series. Like everybody else in 2020, the pandemic hit and we had to find another way to survive and which we'll talk about, but what the way that we got by was we created a venue on top of our venue. So literally where you're looking now, we are standing on top of the venue that we normally produce shows inside of. Prior to 2020, you know, we did 1,200 cap inside of the inside the cave, and we could do 850 seated. We had about 45 to 55 staff on a non-televised show, and the the real unique thing about the cave is that it draws fans of all bands from everywhere. People come from outside of the country; and they come from all over the United States just to experience seeing their favorite band play inside the cave. So we were faced with a really, not only are we faced with the dilemma that we don't have a venue anymore, but this venue is so unique in, uh, in and of itself that we require the space to uh, the cave is what actually draws people because we're not in a DMA like Denver, Nashville, or uh, New York City. We're in the middle of nowhere. and People are actually coming to have that experience. They're coming out to get into nature, get away from the urban environment, come out, experience something very different. But what's required of that is that they go inside the cave. Um, the cave is, um, you know, people are, some people are claustrophobic, some, some people uh, are just love caves, but they have a certain allure to them. They have a certain intrigue to them. Uh, that's what draws fans to come to shows inside the cave. But it also, uh, we found, um, you know, it, I think that it's a, it's a scary place to go inside of, uh, in, in a pandemic when uh, with lots of other people. And it's more so a perception that, um, you know, you're inside of a cave and, and that, that COVID might be worse inside of the cave, but um, obviously, it, you know, we're required to shut down like all other venues. In 2020, we had 85 ticketed events booked, plus we had um, private events throughout the week, and all of those um, events are required for us to be able to cover the overhead that we have for the property, for construction, to build the venue, um, there's a lot of overhead costs, our utilities, a lot of, none of these costs were furloughed or went away during the pandemic. There's some shots inside the cave. So on March 7th of 2020, like everybody else, we were shut down. Uh, Arlo Guthrie was the last show that we had. And um, 
Come to find out, he he has since retired from public performance. This was his last performance. Uh, the venue is still closed to this day. Uh, the underground venue. We are working now. We do have shows on sale for August to go back inside the cave with en enhanced um, airflow. And um, obviously, we're still going to have some COVID mitigation in involved, depending on how things are when we do end up going back inside. But we're still closed since March 7th of 2020, as of right now. Of all the 85 ticketed events that we were uh, budgeted to do in 2020, we could only complete four of them because we um, only do shows on weekends. And being in a rural area, it's tough to get people out on weekdays. So we could only complete four of the 85 ticketed events, and we didn't complete any private events in 2020. So this is what the venue has looked like for the last year and a half. It is... Um, She's still pretty, but it is, it's, it's been a very lonely space for uh, too long, and we can't wait to fill it back up with people, fans, and bands again. So in the initial response, you know, we dealt with what everybody else dealt with, which was a, you know, trying to get in contact with agents and uh, band management and figure out how to reach their fans and try to get them to retain their tickets and to reschedule their shows. Um, like everybody else, we were looking three, three months out every time we were rescheduling. And it wasn't until late summer that we realized that this wasn't going away and that we, we were going to have a long-term issue on our hands. So we had 19 total shows that actually rescheduled. We have 14 shows that were canceled uh, by artist request. Um, over 10,000 tickets were refunded to customers and over $800,000 in total refunds. And, and none, of this, none of this has anything to do with our overhead costs or anything because we're still paying that. This is just the refunds that went out for shows in 2020. So not knowing what to do here, we did get a phone call from uh, Jason Isbell's team at one point, and they asked us if we could look at, you know, maybe doing something socially distanced outside, inside, just trying to find something to do. He's local in Nashville, and we work closely with his, his team on other shows and, and with him as well. And, um, you know, we looked at doing socially distant shows inside the cave, but the square footage just like most clubs and venues is just, wasn't um, it's not enough space to be able to do uh, a six foot distance between everybody and still be able to cover our costs and let alone be able to cut a check to a band at the end of the day. So what did we do? We looked up and we ended up finding this field that you see, this is an aerial shot of the field where we now have our concert venue. And we said, you know what, we think that we can do something on this field we can clear it. We can we can try to put on something outside and do it as safe as possible. And uh, you know, we began construction in 2020. Uh, we we did look to the state of Tennessee. Did put out guidance called the Tennessee Pledge for Reopening. Um, we also obviously looked at the CDC's guidance, and are still looking at the CDC guidance. And we looked. Uh, at a suggestion from um, the ISBEL team of some pod events that were happening in the UK already as early as July of 2020. And we, we looked at those and we made a plan to create uh, a pod-based uh, outdoor concert venue on top of our cave. Uh, this was a pure partnership. We planned every single detail hand in hand with, with the artist team. Uh, we went on sale with four nights on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We sold out um, all four nights, and this was in October of 2020. Uh, we did, there was a lot of planning and implementation that went into it. We had to survey and measure, resurvey and remeasure where all these pods were gonna go. Um, we had to put in, you know, as many people have said throughout the, the pandemic and on the industry side, the music industry side, that you know, we're not epidemiologists, but we had to create um, plans and procedures so that, um, you know, things made sense for first the artist, 
our crew, the artist crew, um, obviously the, and then obviously the patrons, of course, um, we had to build a stage and a roof. We had to plan for weather. We had been a music venue that has not had to really worry about weather for a very long time. And this was the first time we've ever had to deal with the weather. We had issues with ticketing because we had to ticket pods versus, um, versus GA events or even just reserve seats because we're, we're ticketing it as a pod. So we had to kind of reinvent the wheel with our Eventbrite reps on how to do that. Um, and we had to figure out how to market to, to fans in the, during the shutdown who on a day-to-day -day basis were getting fed different and new information. You can see here's a picture of the venue done um, with all the pods and, and the stage in place. Um, you know, big takeaway was the relationship between the artist team and the promoter in the venue is uh, key and it was necessary for what we did. Uh, it couldn't have happened without that relationship and, of course, the trust that we had uh, between the, the two teams. You know, moving forward, we looked ahead and we looked at actually in the fall, things started to get worse. So as we were going to put on an event, things started to kick up and get worse. And we realized that we had to uh, punt to 2021. We weren't going to be able to do more shows. The fans didn't seem to be responding uh, and the bands were no longer responding to wanting to do something in, in the fall or winter 2020 as we started to go back, numbers were starting to go back up again. So we realized that we needed to look to 2021 and put all of our focus on making sure that we had a way to do shows in 2021. That meant we needed to build trust between more artist teams and we need to reach out to them and let them know what we were doing and, and make sure that they were ready to, uh, to join us on the journey. There's so much that goes, went into what we did uh, for marketing materials and uh, testing and screening procedures increased. It also increased our staff and show hours, the weather planning. We had to do merchant concessions via delivery so that we didn't have long lines. Um, this, we did staggered arrival times. We had to educate our staff and crew and attendees continually, even as things changed. There was enhanced cleaning. Um, it, uh, the, the offer and, and legal language had to be modified. Um, one of the things that we did to really help us to, uh, to, to, to communicate what we're doing to fans and, and the bands was to put together a video, which I'll show you now. So the, the, the video was really a key part of what we did to convince and, and build trust with the bands that we had something that would work for them. And uh, also, of course, with the fans. But the video, we, we really leaned in hard to, to reach out to artists with and let them know that we had a plan in place that could work. 
you know, it has worked very well. We've had happy customers. We're 31 shows deep and we're going to do about 45 shows. Um, you know, it's, we've learned a lot of positive things from it and we've learned some negative things from it, but we've learned and, uh, we will go forward and be stronger. Um, we hope that, uh, the whole industry can recover and, um, we're going to run out of time here. I do want to thank, um, Steel Britain at Eventbrite, all the fans who came out, and um, Hazel for helping me put this together, and of course the artists and the staff and crew who uh, we couldn't have done it with. You know, they came out and they put their own families' health and safety at risk in their own. It's in. Thank you all.